Thank you. Um, so we have uh, 12 o'clock here, so we'll get go ahead and get started. And um, this meeting is getting recorded, so we will uh, make sure that, you know, if you missed the meeting, you can see it later. I um, so I'll go ahead and um, uh, introduce our two speakers and also let people in as uh, they're coming in. But uh, based on uh, their preference, we're going to hold questions till the end. So please use the chat feature to put in your questions, and we will make sure that I uh, will ask the speakers the questions uh, near the end. And uh, other than that, I guess uh, enjoy the talk. Well, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, our two speakers. We have uh, Mr. Tom uh, Horvath from um, NASA Langley. He's the senior research engineer in the aerothermo aerothermodynamics branch of the research directorate at Langley, where he has been working for 36 years. His uh, primary interests are based on uh, experimental research to determine, assess, optimize, and benchmark aerodynamic characteristics in heating environments. He has published over 120 NASA conference and journal articles. His, uh, and he has worked on many different projects of particular significance are the uh, shuttle Columbia accident investigation and subsequent shuttle return to flight. Our second speaker is Dr. Jennifer Inman, who serves as the project manager for the sci-fi team. That's the topic area of interest today. In, her, in this role, she leads a diverse group of researchers and subject matter experts in acquiring remote engineering data, flight, remote engineering flight data from vehicles during space operations. She started working at NASA as a grad student and conducted research in support of uh, space shuttle return to flight. And with that, please take it away, uh, I think Tom. All right. And Jennifer, if you can if you can go to full screen. I will do. And a special shout out. I see um, we've got Megan McCleary and Dr. Shan Rufer and Dr. Kim Jung Kim, all members of our sci-fi team on with us today. So um, they all know this stuff already. <laughs> we'll try not to put them to sleep, right, Jen? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. As, uh, as you've heard, I, I've, I've worked my entire career at NASA. I've been in actually one branch. The name has changed multiple times, but but one branch. So my kind of area of expertise is the, you know, the hypersonics, the ground-based wind tunnel testing, specifically the aero heating environments with spacecraft. A kind of a, a neat thing here, both Jennifer and I have our, our physics degrees. Jennifer is a doctor. I'm still a mister. <laughs> have my master's. Um, so next slide, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, so where I want to take you guys today, um, I'm having a, hold on just a sec, there we go. So uh, I, I do really appreciate the opportunity to share our, our success story with you guys. Uh, I'll kind of, where I want to go today, I'll start off by providing you kind of my personal story on how how the team really got started in the aftermath of the uh, Columbia accident investigation. And then I'll turn it over to Jennifer to talk, really to get into the details about, you know, our team, how we're, how our success oriented team, how we kind of enabled a paradigm shift in, term of, in terms of how the agency obtains engineering data in flight. That, that really ultimately allows us to more accurately assess the behavior of spacecraft in very extreme environments. It, at the end there, if there's sufficient time, I'll, I'll come back briefly to share uh, a kind of a new emerging capability that we're developing. NASA has a, a fostered a partnership with the Department of Defense that is kind of tied to uh, uh, what we're gonna be talking about today. And then Jennifer will wrap things up by sharing some of her perspectives on leadership. Jennifer does a really great job, it's one of the reasons why I really <laughs> tried to encourage her to become a sci-fi project manager. She's just a very wonderful people person and she does a, a very really good job of weaving the human element into our success. I, I kind of tend to be dry and technical, but Jennifer really brings that human element out and that, that's really kind of neat. So um, when I started NASA in 1986, the, the shuttle was already routinely flying returning from low Earth orbit. Um, and as most of you know, the audience I'm speaking to, the, the tremendous amount of energy that's imparted to the, to the shuttle to get it to the International Space Station now had to be dissipated uh, upon its descent back to Earth. 
So we're talking speeds of around, you know, 18,000 miles an hour were encountered and, you know, with the friction with the Earth's upper atmosphere when it came back briefly generated, you know, surface temperatures of you know, anywhere between two to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, depending on what part of the spacecraft you were, you're talking about. And then on, on, the, uh, on the right there, we've got spacecraft traveling, you know, to the planets in our solar system, or maybe even returning from beyond the moon, bringing back, back uh, you know, samples of asteroids. They're returning, they're traveling at even greater speeds, and, and they encounter, the atmospheres they encounter produce not only the, the convective heating that we usually talk about, but now the radiative heating from the, from the gas chemistry that's occurring that's surrounding these spacecraft. It's kind of similar to that the radiative heating you feel around your campfire when you're sitting around the, uh, the campfire there. All of this results in surface temperatures that, that now can approach any up to like 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And we've got to protect the spacecraft from those, those kinds of uh, you know, severe thermal environments. So the, the, uh, the TPS systems that I'll uh, often be referring to, TPS, are, are required to protect both the crew and the spacecraft hardware, the payloads from, from these extreme temperatures. And then I guess when I was pulling this presentation together, I was actually working on renovating a uh, old trailer, that utility trailer that was given to me. So kind of had the analogy here, you know, I mean, the heavier the truck is, and that, that's kind of like the heat shield, it's really the, the less stuff you can haul, you can tow. So, you know, if you equate that to spacecraft, you know, we have to make these heat shields thicker, heavier than they really need to be. That just means, you know, less payload, less science going to a planet or coming back from a planet or, or perhaps, you know, uh, the crew, you know, actually eats into the crew complement. So it really does have a, uh, a profound impact on, on, on spacecraft design. So um, when I began my career in the, in the 80s, it really was the then senior researchers at the field centers. It was primarily Langley, Ames, Glenn Research Center. They're the guys that had performed all the ground testing that really went into the uh, design of the uh, shuttle uh, aerothermal environments. So all that was done in the late 60s, early 70s. And as such, I, I personally really wasn't directly involved in the development of the shuttle. You know, and, and once the shuttle became operational, you know, in, in the uh, mid 80s, the work really shifted to the manned space flight centers and the research centers, you know, weren't really involved. So the work kind of went to Marshall, Johnson and, and Kennedy and, and, and the, the uh, research centers were not directly really involved. So next chart, Jim. Um, but all that changed on February 1st, 2003, you know, with the loss of the uh, Columbia and her crew. I remember it, uh, you know, I was watching actually, it was uh, early morning and I had breakfast with my kids and we were watching the return and, and I saw that picture on the top there, you know, they were uh, showing the uh, reentry over Texas and, and <laughs> I knew that we weren't supposed to be looking at what we were looking at, you know, the fragmentation and breakup of the vehicle over Texas. So that was a very, very moving, powerful, uh, you know, event that occurred, at least in my career. And ultimately, you know, in order to move forward, NASA needed to first understand, you know, what was the physical cause? And, and of course, naturally the institutional causes, we're not talking about that necessarily today, but, but once we understand the phys physical cause, then we had to mitigate the risks associated with uh, a compromised thermal protection system. And this, this kind of really required tool development by the research center. So the research centers uh, were going to be uh, re-engaged in the process. Now. So um, within days of the accident, I was in the hypersonic wind tunnels, really trying to replicate possible damage that might explain the, uh, the failure of the uh, thermal protection system uh, during re-entry. So you can actually see some of there on the right, some of that uh, results, early results were actually you know, captured in, in aviation week and space technology. And ultimately it was determined that the phys physical cause of Columbia's breakup was due 
to the liberation of some uh, foam debris on the uh, 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 thermal protection system with the external tank broke free and, and struck the uh, orbiter uh, and damaging the, uh, the leading edge of the wing. And while I didn't personally know the crew that you see there on the left, it, it really was a very humbling experience for me, you know, and it's, I still, as I'm talking, I, it still kind of moves me, you know, for a research center guy to be in the spotlight working, you know, working, not research, but forensics associated with the loss of, of, of this vehicle and the crew. It, it, it really was a big driver in, in, the, in the change in direction my career took subsequently. Um, so next chart, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it became clear that, you know, before returning the shuttle, you know, back to flight, NASA needed to better understand the implications of a compromised, i.e. damaged thermal protection system. We really didn't have the tools to, to really, uh, or the processes to identify damage and then, you know, and then do an analysis to determine is, is this damage is it something we can return home safely or is this something we have to repair? So the next two years of my career were really devoted to, I was part of a large team to developing tools that were based on wind tunnel data that ultimately could be used to disposition damage in flight. And so those the graphics that I got there in the lower left, those are actually you know, the color images of the orbiter. Those are infrared images. So the, the warmer colors indicate areas of higher temperature. The cooler colors, the blues, indicate areas of, of lower surface temperature. And what we were doing was just, you know, kind of in the wind tunnel with thousands of wind tunnel runs, we were mimicking several forms of damage. Um, you know, you could have a tile there that had an impact, a gouge, a depression from something hitting it. You could actually have, you know, steps or bumps or protrusion. And this was, you know, we were thinking at the time, you know, this could be uh, things with the, associated with a repair that actually, you know, created a bump on the, on the uh, surface. And then you could have a third form where, you know, this repair might actually, during reentry, might outgas. So you could actually have mass flow into the phone. All these things, all these mechanisms could, can cause the boundary layer around the vehicle to go from a laminar to a turbulent state. And what you're seeing in those images there on the lower left, those wedges, kind of like the kind of like the wake behind a speedboat. That's that's the thermal footprint of that turbulence that you see and that, uh, that you know clearly has elevated temperature. And so we were wanting to understand just when does that occur? Given a form of damage, when does that occur? And, and that was the driver for these tools, you know, uh, trying to understand if this kind of transition to turbulence occurred at Mach 18 or higher, you know, understanding where that turbulence propagates on the surface and what kind of, you know, quantitatively, what kind of surface temperature increases occur, that would feed into the tools that would allow us to position damage. Unfortunately, <laughs> Fortunately, the very first return to flight mission, it, it, it carried a colleague of mine, Charlie Camarda. So his, you know, his safe return kind of made this mission more personal for me. You know, we was part of an engineering team down there. We would get pictures of the damage on orbit. There you see pictures. There were some gap fillers. Or you see in the far upper right, I'm pointing to some damage we're seeing on the camera. There's these gap fillers sticking out and we're like, oh boy. So we, you know, used our tools and unfortunately, because these are wind tunnel derived tools, we had a lot of uncertainties in terms of extrapolating the, the, the data to flight. We just didn't have a lot of flight data. And we had to tell the program manager, you need to send an astronaut there for a, a risky spacewalk to repair that damage. And there's the, Steve Robinson. He was again, he was another former Langley you know, colleague that I knew. He had to go out there and pull that gap filler to make that repair. That was a very difficult repair, uh, you know, recommendation for me to, to make. So yeah, Jennifer, that next slide um, kind of indicates, this is where I started thinking about, you know, hey, what if we actually got flight data to reduce those uncertainties of those tools? Could we 
could we put, could we rep replicate TPS damage in a controlled manner somewhere on the vehicle and, and collect measurements in flight? <laughs> As you can imagine, you know, what we were arguing was, you know, we want to put a bump on the shuttle. <laughs> and, and, you know, could that be, you know, done safely? And it took a while to convince the managers and the astronauts who were going to be flying in the shuttle. Yeah, we know what we're doing. We, you know, we just told you to remove something, some damage on the orbiter, and now we're coming back to them and saying we want to put something intentionally on the orbiter that would promote transition to turbulence. And uh, so the challenge was, is you know, there was just limited thermocouples on the shuttle. We, you can see the location on the wing where we wanted to put the uh, this little bump. You can see the inset there, that uh, tile with this little four inch long bump, quarter inch high bump. And uh, behind it was where we were expecting to see that uh, increase in, in temperature due to turbulence. And there just wasn't any, really any thermocouples. And we could, we were only offered a handful of thermocouples that we could add to the vehicle. So I kind of asked myself, well, why can't we do the kinds of things where the optical measurements we're making in the wind tunnel? Why can't we do that in flight? And that was the uh, focus of, uh, of an effort then, um, uh, um, you know, what I learned here was <laughs> many felt making such a measurement in flight, that is an infrared measurement from either the ground or some kind of imaging system or carried aloft on an aircraft, trying to make that measure infrared measurement on the, on, the, on the spacecraft returning from orbit. Many felt that that was not possible. We just couldn't do it. And I guess a lesson learned to you guys is if you really believe in something, don't give up. Because I can't tell you how many times, you know, I was told this isn't going to work. <laughs> and I did use my influence early on to direct a, a Department of Defense aircraft uh, underneath the shuttle. It was the best effort. We had, you know, it was just me, no team, no planning tools. But we had some success. So those are those two grayscale images on the uh, upper right of that uh, collage there, the grayscale. The, the white means it's, it's infrared data, but it's saturated. It was overexposed. And I went back to the NASA Engineering Safety Center and requested funding to build a team, what we call high therm, hypersonic thermodynamic infrared measurements to develop the, the team and the tools to do it right. And that kind of collage kind of chronicles how we, you know, we, we uh, built a shuttle array, put it on top of a tower, took it up to using solar light to, to heat that tile array up to 2000 degrees. We literally flew the aircraft, you know, 10 miles away and we practiced, could we do this? And how, what kind of changes would we have to make the camera to make it happen? And ultimately we were successful. There's Jennifer sent me that picture there on the right. I think she was just at the Smithsonian a couple weeks ago with her kids and She's pointing to the bump on the wing. So that orbiter up there, it still has that bump on the wing. And that, that bump you see uh, in the image on that collage there on the wing, upper wing, that's the area of localized heating due to that turbulence behind that bump. What catches your eye is that much larger wedge on the orbiter. We didn't expect that. And that's actually the same, it's turbulent flow, but it was from some imperfection up near the nose landing gear door. So that kind of grabbed everyone's attention. And if you go to the next chart, Jennifer, um, that's what, you know, kind of uh, allowed us to, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 perform several ops, multiple observations of a shuttle during hypersonic range. They now saw what was possible, we could do it. And, um, you know, uh, anticipating the end of the program, the shuttle program in 2011, the team postured to, to, to go just beyond this kind of thermal imaging. We did continue, so the graphics up there show, uh, you know, an example of the uh, Orion cap. Jennifer's gonna talk a little bit about that temperature image of the Orion caps during the entry back in 2014 during that test flight. We now do Routinely, we were deeply involved with the development and the eventual qualification of the uh, parachutes of our commercial providers for their capsules. And um, uh, that was like a two year effort. And you know, we were using high resolution visible imaging to, to inform on the performance of those systems. And then more recently, again, I think Jennifer's gonna mention it, 
we, you know, where visual uh, spatial resolution is not possible, the spectra, we can tease a lot of information about the gas chemistry, what's going on in the shock layer and in the wake, just simply by the, uh, the light emitted by the uh, atomic and, and molecular emissions that are occurring in the, in the flow field. So our name has changed to SciFly, Scientifically Calibrated Inflow Imaging, to reflect that expanded capability. And, and I guess I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer now to uh, kind of tell you a little bit more about what we do under SciFly banner. Tom, thanks, Tom. I'm going to turn my microphone on now. Go back to full screen here. So, thanks for the great uh, history and background. Um, I met I met Tom when I was a brand new grad student, and he was working in the shuttle return to flight. And I can underscore what he said about just you know even not knowing the astronauts personally. That's something that hit me really hard early in my career, and um, became kind of a fuel that's that's driven me all these years. That um, we have to do better um, so people come home to their families. Um, so here, um, what does our team do and where do we fit in, in the NASA um, picture? Um, there's something that we've started calling the triad you see there on the left. And um, we've got computational tools that are continually improving. We've got ground test facilities and wind tunnels and test ranges. And then you have flight truth data because either from CFD or from ground test results, you have to extrapolate to what the conditions are likely to be in flight when it comes to hypersonics. And um, so flight truth data helps fill in that gap and helps us improve our tools. Um, and one of the things that I have learned quickly in being part of this team is that uh, getting the data and having a high degree of mission success requires extensive planning. And it's about the relationships of people that are involved. We need people who possess a wide range of skills and diverse skills across all kinds of organizations. Um, and so here's a, a quick map of a recent mission we did and all of the different partnerships that were required to pull the mission off. Um, and you can see they're scattered around the country and uh, around the world in some cases. Um, so here's a little bit of an eye chart and I just want to show you a few of the the, the big picture of how we put a mission together. So there are all the mission planning pieces that happen up front. Um, so that's knowing what the trajectory is, where's the spacecraft going to be, what, what's required, what kind of spatial resolution is desired, what kind of thermal resolution is desired. Um, then there's actually pulling the mission off, um, which uh, involves deploying people and aircraft and um, <laughs> watching the weather and moving aircraft to where, to where there are no clouds in the way if possible. Um, once we have the data, there's processing that data and analyzing it, and then finally producing uh, data products and reports. And the bulk of the work that we do is in the first box in mission planning. Uh, because when you are trying to image a spacecraft at horizon break going uh, Mach 25 and you're in an aircraft going 100, 300 knots, um, you're, and you're zoomed way in with really high powered optics, you're basically imaging through a soda straw. So you've got to be looking in the right place at the right time with the right sensor settings if you're going to get the data that you want. Um, so I'm going to use uh, experimental flight test, exploration flight test one. Um, this is a flight of Orion that orbited the earth um, a couple times and uh, show you how the team, this is before I was part of the team, but how they um, use that process I just described. So starting, you start out with the spacecraft trajectory. Where's the capsule going to be? And what, um, what kind of spatial resolution do we, do we need? Um, and so this shows the, the calculations that we're able to do with some of the tools that the team has developed. And they basically generate synthetic imagery. So you have a 3D model of the, the vehicle in a, in a 3D environment. And then you model the camera parameters. What kind of focal length are you using and how far away are you going to be? And what's the relative angle between the camera and the target? And in that case, you can see there's something that says perfect imaging. That's kind of a, a synthetic image of what we would expect to see. And then you add some atmospheric blurring and you can give our, your stakeholders an, an idea of what the images are going to look like in the real world. And that graph there shows the spatial resolution changes as a function of time. And then you ask yourself, is that adequate? Uh, is it gonna resolve the features of interest? So you can see the compression pads where the, the this is looking at the heat shield of Orion on the upper right there. Um, those compression pads are on the order of 12 inches. And so you can see we're expected to be able to resolve uh, those, those 
um, uh, objects. And this is uh, showing um, at the time of peak heating, we placed the aircraft such that we maximized the spatial resolution. And then you can see how long you expect to have good spatially resolved imagery across uh, the flight. So here's, uh, once you have an estimate of what the vehicle is going to look like, you also have to estimate what kind of intensity you're going to get. So brighter things, you're gonna get more photons to your sensor. Um, and you want to make sure that your sensors are set so that the image is not saturated, but also that you have high enough signal to noise. Um, and so there's a, um, a pre-flight and an in-flight image um, showing the performance of the tools. Uh, here's some of the data that resulted from EFT1. And you can see um, the frames along the bottom are at different times in the flight and um, kind of a, a busy table showing peak temperatures, uh, min and max temperatures and, and how far away we were and things like that. And those circles that you see around the vehicle, you can tell are the compression pads. Um, so once you have the data in hand, how do you process it? And there, there are three steps here, um, improving the image quality, calibrating radiometrically and doing compensation for atmospheric effects. So I'll, I'll whiz through this. Um, if you want access to the slides later, you can look at this, but I figure you don't have to do it yourself quite yet. Um, so I'll show you uh, step one, data conditioning. This is um, identifying times where you have lower atmospheric blurring, maybe selecting some frames, um, kind of cherry picking the ones that um, are the clearest um, around a, within a short span of time. And then you can uh, enhance the images and get effectively higher spatial resolution through interpolation techniques. Um, so all of this results in um, a intensity map that preserves the radiometric accuracy, but you have one image that's um, a little bit better than the individual single shots. And then once you have that image, you have to say, okay, for every um, number of counts on my sensor, how does that translate into the, the irradiance um, that came from the vehicle? So you use your calibration there um, where you see how your sensor responds to radiance, uh, how that translates into sensor counts and work your way backwards. And then um, we want to know what was the actual irradiance coming from the heat shield. So the photons that came from the heat shield uh, got absorbed and scattered by the atmosphere on its way to the sensor plane. So on the, the bottom left there, you see kind of the estimated line of sight transmittance as a function of time and um, you calibrate out for those absorption and scattering events. And that results in um, uh, an irradiance image. And then you use black body uh, curves and emissivity curves, which tell you how bright something's going to be depending on the relative angles and the material properties of the emitter. And finally, you have your surface temperature of the heat shield calibrated image. So that's the, the quick, quick overview. Um, so something that was done during EFT1 was to compare the results uh, to onboard data. So traditionally you have embedded thermocouples. We still continue to have onboard sensors, but they're at discrete locations. Um, and one thing to point out here is that the failure modes, you know, on, on the remote imaging side, we're susceptible to things like an aircraft having an engine problem and not being able to take off or a thick layer of clouds that prevents us from imaging. Um, onboard sensors are um, more vulnerable to other failure modes, um, wires breaking and interference from electromagnetic effects and things like that. Um, these th thermocouples are embedded below the surface. So you actually have to extrapolate from the location where the thermocouple is known to be. And you have to estimate the thickness of the heat shield, which in this case is an ablative heat shield, at the time of the measurement to estimate what the surface temperature was. So you see there are two images, one from um, two different times in the flight. And uh, the blue shows the estimated temperature from the remote imaging, and the red shows the estimated temperature from the thermocouples. And you see that there's um, a systematic difference between them. So this is something that's uh, been ongoing work. You can see on the graph on the left, um, the noisy data um, at the time of close to peak heating, um, where thermocouples seem to be susceptible to um, some kind of noise um, and the best guess we have right now is that it comes from electromagnetic inter interference. Uh, you've got a plasma on, on the heat shield and you've got free electrons everywhere sloshing around. And it appears that that interferes with um, the performance of thermocouples. So these are good complementary techniques um, 
for trying to figure out how a heat shield actually performs in flight. Um, and speaking of thermal protection systems, um, here's some of the ways that, that HITHERM and SciFly have studied TPS performance across launch, staging, and reentry phases of flight. Um, as an example here is something known as plume-induced plume flow separation. Um, this is something uh, on Saturn V. I'll show you an example. This is a zoom in on that image. And this is approximately where the vehicle is relative to that dirty kerosene flame. And because it's a visible flame, you can see that um, the plume from the rocket exhaust, especially as you get to higher altitudes, um, you could think of it as acting like a physical protuberance um, that then creates a shock layer in front of it. And that shock layer, um, there's subsonic flow behind the shock that permits exhaust gases to move forward along the, the outside of the vehicle. And so you expect to get augmented heating on the outside of the vehicle, and you want to make sure that you've got adequate uh, thermal protection on the outside of the vehicle due to that uh, plume-induced flow separation. So we'll be looking at, at that on uh, Artemis 1 during the SLS launch. Um, in that case, it's going to be a, a hydrogen oxygen flame. So it will not be visible the same way the kerosene flame was. So we need uh, infrared imaging to see if there's augmented heating on the outside of the core stage. Um, also um, on SLS for Artemis 1, um, the base of the core stage. So we're kind of looking at the, the, the bottom of the rocket there. And you see the Saturn V had five engines, but uh, SLS has four, um, not counting the solids. And what happens is that the, the exhaust plumes that are normally expanded at sea level pressure, as you get to higher atmospheric pressures, um, the, the background pressure at the core of the rocket is lower. And that causes an entrainment of the high pressure exhaust gases back up towards the vehicle. And um, so we want to know what is that heating and it, is there adequate thermal protection system or is there excess thermal protection system to prevent from the recirculation effect of the, the hot exhaust gases. Um, this is the temperatures that we expect during SLS launch are quite different and um, then you get during reentry. And in addition, you've got all the, the rocket exhaust plumes and the solid rocket plumes that interfere with getting a clear view to the base of the core stage. So um, to that end, SAMI, our Sci-Fi Airborne Multispectral Imager system is an imaging system that's been designed custom for uh, SLS launch, um, and, but it is configurable for future flight operations. And it's been designed to allow us to um, get the best shot we can at getting thermal data on SLS launch. Um, so that's a system um, on the right there, you see the ball turret that's on the nose of the WB-57, uh, which is a high altitude aircraft seen behind Kerry Scott, our deputy PI there. Um, and Sammy's being integrated into that ball turret and um, is due to start flight testing in about a week or so. Um, another thing that we can do, um, we're going to be looking at solid rocket separation during SLS launch. You notice uh, on the shuttle there, the solids protrude well below the, the base of the orbiter, whereas on SLS, as you can see on the right, they're even with the, the main engines. And so there's some concern that during um, stage separation, as you drop the solids, that there could be recontact with the vehicle. We want to make sure that that's not happening and, and see if we can get quantitative data on how close the solids come when they separate from the main vehicle. Um, another place that TPS is important is, of course, uh, reentry and peak heating. Um, here you see some wind tunnel data of the Orion segmented ablative heat shield. Um, and um, unfortunately, the funding for a sci-fi observation during peak heating has been cut. Uh, we, we have a Hail Mary uh, request in to use Department of Defense assets right now. It doesn't look like those will be ready in time or available, but <clears throat> we're, uh, we're still hoping and at least hoping that in um, future missions we can get that get that data. Um, right, another thing that we've SciFly has done is to use our skills to help NASA understand what I'm calling contingency flight safety systems. So these are launch abort systems. Um, so here's some data that our and I just wanted to let you know you're 30 minutes in. Excellent, thank you. Um, this is what our our partners at Mars Scientific, here's a series of images they got during the Orion Max launch abort test. Um, and 
the la a launch abort system can do several things. There's a pad abort capability if you're sitting on top of a rocket in a capsule and something goes wrong, like a fuel leak, um, while you're on the pad, a pad abort system can pull the capsule to safety. But a launch abort system um, is designed during launch and before orbital insertion if something goes wrong to pull the capsule to safety. Um, and here's an, a real life example that's happened just recently back in 2018 uh, during a Soyuz launch, uh, during separation of one of the solids. Um, and this is, you know, a system that's that's flown, um, you know, 50 times or more. Um, something went wrong and it didn't detach properly and the vehicle started to um, become uncontrollable and the launch abort system pulled the capsule to safety. And you see a picture there of the um, NASA astronaut and cosmonauts uh, reunited with their family later that day. So these uh, flight termination systems, they really matter. Um, here's some uh, images from the Orion ascent abort test uh, that we are part of. The picture taken from there on the left from the cockpit of the WB-57. Um, also supported the Boeing pad abort test. Um, and uh, the data we got are actually much higher resolution than the image shown there. This is a, a screenshot from the NASA live broadcast since the data themselves have not been cleared for public release, but this one was released. So, um, And here's a picture from the SpaceX in-flight abort test. Um, it's not every day that you know that a rocket's going to explode in front of you. So uh, there's some of the imagery from our Mars scientific partners again, um, another successful test um, with some really great data. Another thing that our team has done is to support uh, hypervelocity uh, missions, um, the capsules coming back from beyond low Earth orbit and even beyond uh, lunar orbit. Um, we get data for NASA's Entry Systems Modeling Group, uh, who's tasked with the engineering uh, heat shields and thermal protection systems and entry descent and landing systems for um, all kinds of missions, both returns to Earth and, and landing on other solar system bodies. So. Um, back in 2006, the team supported the return of the Stardust capsule. Um, and then the European Space Agency's automated transfer vehicle. Uh, we, it was uh, intentionally destroyed destructively. Um, and uh, it's, it's not every day you have a calibrated meteor where you know where it's going to come in and you know what the composition of the object is before it enters Earth's atmosphere. So. You can see on the upper left there some of the spectral data that were acquired um, in the team down at the bottom left. And then uh, back in 2010, uh, the first Hayabusa mission, partnership with the Japan's Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, um, the team flew the NASA DC-8 and got some really great data on the reentry of that capsule. Um, it's actually a more interesting set of images than it might have been otherwise. The service module did not detach successfully before the reentry burn. And so um, the actual capsule is kind of the, the bright pixel on the, the bottom right of those images. Um, and then the, all the stardust behind that is the service module uh, breaking up. So that was down in Australia. Um, and we have a memorandum of understanding with JAXA whereby um, when they fly an asteroid sample return, um, they give NASA 10% of whatever sample they collect. And when we fly an asteroid sample return, we give them 10% of what we collect. And um, acquiring data, airborne data like this is part of that uh, memorandum of understanding. So Hayabusa 2 occurred uh, during the height of the pandemic um, in December of 2020. We took two NASA aircraft down to Australia and acquired data on the returning Hayabusa 2 capsule. This is a capsule that's about the size of a beach ball um, and it's entering the Earth's atmosphere at about Mach 42. So there you see on the bottom left, kind of a, a CAD drawing of um, showing the gimbal systems that we used. And on, now on the bottom right, you see a video showing uh, the aircraft integration process of some of our spectrometers. Uh, we had 14 different sensors, um, some were um, lower spectral res resolution, but wider spectral band spanning the, the near IR to the near UV. Um, and other instruments were higher spectral resolution, but zoomed in on a particular part of the spectrum that was of interest. Um, and here, um, this is a, a video uh, showing on the left, you have a low light camera where you can see the capsule 
um, itself. And um, once, once you start seeing the capsule on the right, what you're going to see is some of the spectral data that we got from our calibration spectrometer. Um, so the vertical axis is going to be the intensity at um, a given wavelength. And along the, the bottom, the horizontal axis is time. Um, so you can see the, the wide field of view camera there. Um, you can see the plasma trail behind this capsule. Um, I like to describe something that's going supersonic in general, but especially at hypervelocity. Um, when it's going, when the vehicle is going faster than the speed of sound, um, that means that pressure waves don't have time to um, propagate in front of the vehicle. But you get, you know, the sonic booms that you guys would all be familiar with. Um, and that capsule just acts like a piston in a cylinder, compressing a large portion of the atmosphere into a very small space. So you get really high density, really high temperature gas. And uh, the exciting thing is that you get plasma creation when you get to such high temperatures and pressures, um, hotter than the surface of the sun. So you can identify individual species and you can look at their um, recombination rates and reaction rates uh, in ways that we can't replicate in um, uh, laboratories on the ground. So um, that allows us to more accurately predict what's going to happen on future missions. Um, and the data from Hayabusa 2 have already reduced the size of the heat shield that's predicted to be required for Mars sample return missions. So that gives you either more science payload or better vehicle performance if you can cut down on your thermal protection system. Um, the team is now beginning planning for NASA's uh, complementary mission. This is called OSIRIS-REx, returning in September of 2023. So um, this one's coming back to Utah, which hopefully will be easier to plan for than Australia in the middle of a pandemic. With that, I'm going to hand the reins back over to Tom to talk about our, um, uh, our partnership with SkyRange and uh, with the Department of Defense. Yeah. And just wanted to let you guys know we have about 10 minutes left until uh, the question. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. just pretty quick. Uh, so, so, you know, all the observations that Jennifer has talked about were, many of them were done with, you know, large crude aircraft. They're expensive. Uh, they have, you know, limited endurance times, uh, limited ranges. Um, where they can support a lot of these observations, as you imagine, are conducted in re very remote areas, often over water. So um, we're kind of looking to the next gen capability. Um, this is where about five years ago, uh, the SciFlight team um, collaborated with the Armstrong Research Center. Uh, Armstrong had several agency global hawks that actually came from the Department of Defense, they were accessed. And we repurposed them to use them for Earth atmospheric science campaigns, tracking hurricanes, those kinds of things. And the science mission directorate um, was uh, divesting from these assets. And I convinced the uh, agency leadership to kind of enter into a cooperative agreement partnership with the Department of Defense. And these guys are putting a lot of money, resources, about $100 million into reconfiguring these global hawks to support flight test and evaluation. So there will be supporting, you know, national test campaigns, uh, defensive hypersonic weapon systems, but the intent here in the partnership is, you know, the agency could potentially benefit, uh, you know, from these hosted payloads on the, uh, on these global hawks. And uh, on the far left, you see the one I, that's near and dear to me, <laughs> is the uh, electro-optical imaging telescope. That's a very large telescope, large aperture telescope that will be configured on the uh, upper upper half of the uh, Global Hawk to perform imaging. Probably, you know, a factor of 10 time improvement in terms of the spatial resolution that we exist, that we get with exert existing capability. Um, the other two payloads, so you see a phased array telemetry uh, antenna and then a LIDAR-based uh, upward-looking ultraviolet laser to make atmospheric measurements. These two payloads are going to be potentially used during a uh, um, NASA's lofted flight test, um, uh, inflatable you know, uh, aerodynamic decelerator concept. It will be launched and recovered off the east coast of Hawaii, and the intent there is to 
perhaps uh, if we're ready, um, do some imaging of the heat shield during re-entry and then per, uh, use a uh, second system to obtain atmospheric measurements, um, the upper, upper atmospheric winds during the recovery of the lofted vehicle. All of this capability, NASA, we really just don't fly that often to make it you know, pay off to, for NASA to put the investment in this kind of capability. The DOD flies all the time. So, so they're putting a lot of resources to develop this capability and I'm trying to work to position NASA, the agency to benefit uh, through our uh, sci-fi partnership with uh, DOD. So that's kind of where we're going with the uh, capability. Great, Jennifer, thanks, let it uh, see where you want to go with your comments on leadership. Sure. So this the last couple of minutes, um, this was a slide I was asked to put together for a different talk, um, and I thought this audience might appreciate it well. Um, I just a couple minutes. I wanted to talk about um, my personal journey to you know <laughs> trying to fill Tom's shoes uh, as he's uh, preparing for retirement, and I would say that. Um, I think one of the hardest things is that I figured um, the path that I would take would look something like this, or maybe this, um, but particularly once I added marriage and kids to the mix, it felt a lot more like this. Um, and, uh, you know, I needed a machete to find my way through. Um, it's been a lot more challenging than I thought. Um, and um, one of the things that's been hard is um, imposter syndrome. It was very helpful to me to, to have that named and understand what that is. Um, but that's, that's a real thing. Um, particularly, you know, the day I got my PhD, I think I was, I was so stunned because I thought I, I knew about half of what I expected to, to know. I remember thinking, well, when am I going to learn all the things um, <laughs> that I thought I would know at this point? Um, and also I think ever since having kids, especially, um, I have just felt like a, a failure in every area of my life, um, at work. Um, I felt like my work productivity dropped way down. I felt like I wasn't being the wife I wanted to be and I wasn't being the mom that I had thought I would be. And um, I had a, a small crisis um, in a good way, I guess. I had a performance review several years ago where I got all fives. You know, we can get ones, threes and fives now in our performance evaluations from our supervisors at NASA. And um, it was the first time in my career I'd gotten all fives. and. I came out of it kind of shaken because I thought, I, I felt like I was doing such a poor job at work compared to what I had been doing um, as a PhD student. And so um, the helpful, <laughs> my husband made me put the B plus on there to realize that um, that's what failure <laughs> feels like to me um, in some ways. Um, but it was hopeful because I realized my, my kids aren't saying that I'm a bad mom. My husband's not saying I'm a bad wife and my um, supervisor doesn't think I'm a bad employee. So um, I'm working on uh, recalibrating my internal uh, sense um, of what success looks like. Um, I also uh, developed kind of an aversion to the word balance when people talk about work-life balance. If you Google images of balance, you get things like this. <laughs> my experience has been much more like this or maybe that. Um, and so uh, it's been more like a tug of war back and forth um, where something always feels out of balance. Um, and I, it was helpful. Someone said in the report card of life, B's are for balance. If you're getting an A in any one area of your life, something else is probably suffering. Um, and um, I've also found that, you know, uh, it, it wasn't something I really noticed till I had kids, how, how much of a male dominated field I had entered. Um, but uh, I've been out in the field with over a hundred hundred dudes and two other women um, and realizing um, that the women who went before us um, have made it possible to occupy positions of leadership. And I hope that um, my generation can uh, further open up the space um, where I feel the freedom to lead with my personal strengths and not have to do it the way that men that went before me have done it. Um, and a big part of that is finding people to shore up my personal weaknesses to finding people who are good at the things that I'm not good at. Um, and so we have a fantastic team and people that I can lean on um, here in sci-fi. Um, and finally, I was just going to underscore something we started with, the central importance of the human aspects of what we do. So here's a picture of Mike Hopkins who approached our team while we were in mission control doing um, the demo uh, one mission. And he said, hey, 
you know, it's really nice during communications blackout, you've got your aircraft out there and we can see that the vehicle is in one piece and that it's where it's supposed to be on time, on trajectory. And, you know, we're all holding our breath during communications blackout, wondering if the vehicle's okay. And will you be working my mission? It would be really nice for my wife and kids to be able to see that I'm okay um, when we're out of communication. And we said, we, we sure hope so. And um, we did end up getting funded to do uh, Mike's mission. So there's a picture from the return of crew one taken from the WB-57 aircraft. Um, and then we had Raja Chari um, uh, come out and visit our, our team in the desert. He's the, he's the guy there in the, the orange shirt. And I love, I love this picture because you've got Tom taking a picture of Ron, taking a picture of uh, one of the Mars guys taking a picture of them. Can you tell that taking pictures is important to what we do? Um, and Raja left the case of beer for the overnight crew. And uh, that made it even more meaningful um, when the Crew 3 uh, vehicle launched. Um, my kids and I went out to the Colonial Parkway um, uh, up near Jamestown where we had a clear shot out to the east um, I didn't take this picture. This is from uh, the public media, but the streak there you see is the second stage burn of uh, Crew Dragon. And there was a, a meteor that happened to come down right at the same time and lit up the sky with green light. Um, so Crew 3 is on orbit now. Um, they'll be coming back hopefully uh, in the next week or so after we get Axiom 1 down and Crew 4 up. But it, it adds a, a special element to our team that it's not just a, a shining ball of light out there uh, that we're looking at, but it's, it's Raja and his crew um, inside that capsule. And uh, you know, you can't get these kind of data any other way. And our, our goal is to continually get the data that you can't get any other way so that we can continue to improve the safety of human space flight. So I know that only gives us um, eight minutes for questions, but uh, it came close. <laughs> No, th thank you again for the talk. I I'll say one one piece. I had heard your conversation about you know work life balance uh, before. I think you had also talked to the summer students last year about that. And um, even as a man, um, but I have a young child. I think the pandemic has kind of given me the similar um, you know feelings that you were talking about. So I really appreciate somebody enunciating it, uh, and you know somebody successful who has been able to get to a different places. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah, we don't we don't make this hard thing any easier by pretending it's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, I don't see any questions in the chat right now. Um, I do notice a note from Peter Bunning about how Kulpa Nachala was also a CFD researcher at NASA Ames. I think that was being mentioned before when Tom was mentioning he knows uh, he knew people who were going uh, on mm -hmm. the return to flight uh, mission. But if anybody has any questions, I think you can go ahead and unmute and ask uh, Tom and Jennifer the question. And while we do that, I'll, I'll just uh, scroll through some of our fun pictures while people talk. <laughs> uh, don't feel shy. Um, I guess I can, I can ask one question um, um, uh, for you guys. Um, so the deal with SpaceX, um, um, every launch, do you guys have um, a sci-fi, I guess, contracted or mandated to do every single SpaceX and Boeing launch in return? Or is it basically still a research effort, which ultimately, you know, goes, is uh, not followed more when it becomes more of a normal day of operations kind of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, right now, it's it's still kind of mission by mission, but we are at least we've been asked to provide imaging for the return of every capsule coming back from the space station. So we're doing the SpaceX uh, cargo resupply services missions, and we're doing all of the SpaceX crew missions. Um, and we also have uh, the WB-57 on standby during launch for any mission with crew on it. So the aircraft doesn't fly unless, you know, if there were a failure to dock scenario, if the capsule were to go up and have a problem docking and have to come back uh, early, um, then we would fly the aircraft um, to try to get imagery of the parachutes deploying. Um, parachutes, I'll just say this, uh, it was surprising to me, um, you know, you think parachutes, you think of it with, you know, skydiving or something, but um, when you have parachutes that are deploying at really high altitudes uh, within a launch abort scenario, they could come out at 90 or 100,000 feet, there's very little air up there. So inflation dynamics are really complicated. 
<clears throat> you also have capsules that are going really fast and trying to get fabric and stitching to survive um, these incredibly high speeds is very different than jumping out of a, a aircraft at 10,000 feet to go skydiving. Um, so um, basically we want data on every single parachute deployment that we can get so that we can understand what the family of behavior is and um, uh, notice if there are things that go off nominal. Um, uh, parachutes are the second highest uh, loss of crew risk um, right behind uh, micrometeoroid on orbit debris encounters. Um, so um, if we're going to lose a crew, parachutes are a good guess about why that would happen. So that's kind of the driver for acquiring data on parachute deployments. Um, I guess if anybody else has a question, I have one more follow up. I You talked about the Hayabusa uh, 2 capsule, how it's like a beach ball size capsule. Is there uh, ultimately a reference length of the vehicle that it becomes way too small for you to observe uh, with SciFly? Or is it just basically, an, I don't know, like a higher resolution uh, camera that you guys uh, would have to deploy? That's a good question. Um, the capsule, we were, you know, really far away from that capsule, much further away than we would be from. Um, some of the Dragon capsules, which have active steering. Um, so we had to stay um, uh, quite a distance away. So we were not able to resolve any pixels across the capsule. Um, in this case, all of our data were um, spectral data. Um, and it, it just happens at those hypersonic speeds, you have enough photons coming in that you, you can get um, you know, a nice picture of the wake. Um, but yeah, it's too small at those distances for us to, and with our current optics to resolve. Um, anything on the capsule itself yeah with the with the uh, what we call the range hawk the global hawk configured with its its imaging system um you know with the with the navy aircraft that we currently use you know you've got jennifer showed the the eft1 capsule you had about you know a resolution of about a foot um you know so we're kind of expecting for this those same kind of distances uh you know anywhere from 30 to 50 nautical miles away, you would now have the ability to resolve something down to maybe an inch or so. <laughs> this is a fun yeah, image. That's, someone... that's fantastic. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. This image I have up, um, there was a mission that um, had gotten delayed because the, the C-130 aircraft that we were using, that SpaceX was using to drop their capsule had a maintenance problem. So we anticipated at least a week long delay. Well, SpaceX got creative and ended up finding a helicopter that could do um, the mission. So I got a call at eight o'clock on a Friday night asking if I could be on a 7 a.m. flight the next morning uh, to do a Sunday drop test. Um, and so it, it just so happened that um, none of the people that I call the grownups, like Tom and <laughs> some of the senior researchers were able to make it out. So this was the kids mission and um, uh, Ron Beard photoshopped this for us showing the, the parachutes in the background. We just did this quickly and <laughs> sent it to all of the grownups and said, uh, hey, can we get another hot pass? We missed it. We were eating breakfast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is uh, uh, Rachel. Yeah, what's the stories about the UFOs? Uh, yeah, I was yeah. Say, I did see some. Yeah, we were out in the middle of nowhere, uh, Nevada, where, um, you know, you, <laughs> you, we didn't have cell service for, you know, a day and a half while we were out there. Um, and uh, this was uh, the only accommodations that were available. Uh, we ended up just after this time deciding just to sleep in our cars, but um, it's, uh, it's not too far from Area 51, so it's very uh, <laughs> UFO centric. Um, yeah, there's our, there's our porta potties, yes. So, big upgrade in our accommodations. There are a lot of times where you're out in the middle of nowhere in a, a dry lake bed, which is surrounded by the way, by high power optics, people watching and um, yeah, no no shrubbery to hide behind. So that was a, <laughs> a nice improvement. You better tell them about the wild yeah, dog. Yeah, there were one of these missions out here in California. There were, um, we found out why it's called Coyote Dry Lake Bed. There were some wild dogs that actually chased down a vehicle and um, were able to bite one of the tires. They slowed down trying not to hit the dogs and uh, they actually punctured one of the tires and uh, yeah, gave the, the car a flat tire. Um, it was a <laughs> exciting excitement that we have out in the middle of the desert. No, oh, that's, that's fantastic. Um, well, again, I, I, I see we're one minute into before um, the end of the meeting. I really want to thank both of you for talking. This was a really enjoyable talk. I had heard Jennifer speak before at that uh, 
um, meeting. So I had high hopes and I think uh, you guys definitely <laughs> lived up to that. Thank oh, you thanks. again. Um, we'll be posting these, uh, uh, posting this recording on our YouTube page. So, and if you have any questions for Jennifer and Tom, please reach out to them. They are at NASA, so you should be able to uh, connect with them via, the, uh, via email there. Uh, again, thank you both of you. Appreciate it. Excellent. Thanks, thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, bye.